want to be a diva, but I'm going to need a tall table, and I'm going to need a stool, and I'm going to need somewhere for my stuff. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Gotcha. Okay. You want to move it? You good? I don't want that. Okay. Um, I'm going to move it back. Okay. How's that? Yeah, not good. All right. Tell me if it's distracting. Well, you let the hand Let me do the handheld? Yeah, let's do it. All right, let's do the handheld. That's fine. All right, how's that? Good? That's off. Okay, much better. Okay, well, I'm excited to be here with y'all this morning. Dave said I'm part of the teaching team here with uh, Pastor Dave and Donnie Mabe, and uh, we've known the, the um, Jamersons for 25 years, which well, we met in kindergarten then, right? Yeah, probably about right. <laughs> you do the math. Uh, it's been a while since I've been with y'all. I'm so excited. I was thinking back last time I spoke was in November. We were at Move Dance Center, and then we had Christmas services, and then we had the Growth Track series, which was so powerful. And then, then we did a series on finances. And I was like, I'm going to take a hard pass on that one. I'll see y'all for identity. I mean, I offered to give a workshop on shopping math. Like, Chad loves to hear how much money I save him by hitting up the sale rack. But they didn't want that workshop. So I said I would pass and meet you again for identity. So I'm super excited to be here with you. And, and uh, week two of our series entitled Born Identity. Uh, Paul writes the book of Ephesians. We're studying what the book of Ephesians has to say about our identity in this series. And Paul writes the book of Ephesians to the early church at Ephesus to declare and remind them of the glory of God and the extravagant riches that are given to the church. Because the church at Ephesus isn't a new church, and it's not necessarily a church with problems, so there's no strict warning or strict direction there. But uh, the book of Ephesians shows us who we are in light of who God is and how to live together as his people in, um, in the world. And I suspect that Paul writes it to strengthen them and encourage them. And sometimes God is just that good right? Do we need a reason to write about his extravagant grace and to continue writing about it and continue declaring it? No real reason needed except that God is that good. Let's continue to remind each other how good he is. Amen? So Paul opens his letter with a greeting to the people, a very exuberant greeting to the people of Ephesus, and then he begins in verse 3, and he has this to say. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Listen, there are tons and tons of spiritual blessings, and he wants to give them to you. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. It is his pleasure. Do you ever meet someone, they do something for you, and they say, oh, my pleasure. That's what God is saying. Spiritual blessings, my pleasure. Have all of them. That's what he says here. <laughs> uh, in accordance with his pleasure and his will. He's willing and he's pleased. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has, get, he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through the blood, which we'll discuss, and the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He is wise and understanding and wants to lavish all the spiritual blessings on you and me. That is some good news right there. We could just stop there, go to brunch. Woohoo! <laughs> Basically, what he is saying is that through Jesus Christ, God sees us as blessed, chosen, holy, blameless, adopted. We have sonship, which implies family. We're redeemed. We're redeemed and we're forgiven. This is what Paul's so excited about. This is why he's writing. This was his grand plan, God's grand plan since the beginning of time, and he is pleased to see us this way, pleased to give us his son and lavish on us. 
I'm in. Deal? Deal. But you've heard me say before, I say this because it's true, spin my table, uh, that there's an enemy and he's opposed to this plan. He is not down with this plan. The Bible describes him as a roaring lion, roaming around, seeking someone to devour. And he starts early. He starts real early, attacking our identity and trying to lead us astray. Get us to the place where we don't feel blessed and chosen and forgiven and redeemed. We don't feel part of anybody's family. What then? What do we do then? Well, we don't feel like what we just read. Because if we don't know who we are in Christ, and we will, we will talk about that term. I think it's a very overused, churchy term, like uh, know who you are in Christ. And you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> Find out who I am in Christ. But we'll talk about that in a minute. And that all that is available to us and the way God sees us and our true identity if we don't know that, we can easily let other things define us and, uh, and find our identity in other things. I know in my life, the enemy came early to chip away at my identity. I can remember experiencing feelings of rejection as early as kindergarten. I don't know about y'all. And in the third grade being, you know, left out on the playground. I remember this whole group of kids who... Um, told me I couldn't play with them because I did, wasn't wearing Sperry topsiders. I mean, like, back in the early 80s. Don't you wish you could go back, <laughs> now, knowing what you know now? I'd be like, y'all, I'm going to start a chunky black flip-flop club, and y'all can't be a part. And let me just tell you, your Sperrys are going to go out of style, and the chunky black flip-flop, no, it will stay. <laughs> it will transcend fashion. But you don't know. You're in the third grade, and you're like, wah, wah, I can't play with everybody. I must be bad. I must be unworthy, right? It's subtle. It's subtle, but they're the defining moments nonetheless, and we all have them. We all feel that sting, that, that sinking feeling in your gut. It's rejection. I remember in middle school and high school, I tried to find my identity in just about everything. I tried softball. I tried student leadership. I tried cheerleading. I thought I could be the mascot, and I thought the mascot would be the easiest way to be awkward but still be a cheerleader. But I found out you have to be like the best, most gymnastically minded cheerleader to be the, I couldn't be the, I didn't get to be the cougar, so it's all right. <laughs> but what I did find out, what I was really, really good at was having fun. The kind of fun you have till like two in the morning. <laughs> and it was a lot of fun, tons of fun, until one night it was not. And I was at an open-air amphitheater concert with some friends, and I got separated from my friends, and I was attacked and uh, brutally assaulted by a stranger and left for dead in a parking lot until somebody found me face down in the gravel and uh, took me to a hospital. I survived, and my attacker went to jail, but rumors spread about, I was probably 15 or 16, rumors spread that I deserved it because of the way I was, and that it was my fault. And then part of me, I started to believe them. I hardened my heart, and I kind of became what they said about me. Believing a lie about what little was left of my self-worth and a lie about who I was. And then my life got pretty dark and I put myself in more toxic situations. And I felt like where before there was a little cloud of rejection and, you know, insecurity that hung over my head and followed me around. Now there was this big banner that hung over my head that said worthless, disposable. I felt like the banner over my head said, worthless, disposable piece of trash. And I walked around with this banner hanging over my head for years. Don't you look at me. I was doing good. Chad looked at me. <laughs> I can so relate to what Dave said the last week. Like his career was over. He said, I'm a piece of trash. Throw me away. Worthless. 
One night, I even had a bottle of pills in my hand and was ready to take my life. But just when the devil thought he had me right where he wanted me, y'all, I met Jesus. Jesus always leaves the 99 to look for the one because the one is worth it. Y'all are worth it. He thought I was worth it. He found me worthy. A friend of my invited me to a Bible study in college, and when I heard about Jesus and his unconditional love for me, I became a Christian, and I gave my life to him on the spot. And I was forever transformed because I was raised in the church, and I in the Lutheran church, and I had heard that um, Jesus died for the sins of the world. But when I heard that he had died for me specifically, for my sins, that was the game changer. And that I was redeemed and bought at the highest price by the blood of Jesus. My soul instantly felt its worth. And I realized my value that day. And that's what changed everything. It sounds cliche. It really sounds cliche to say, even when I wrote it, I was like, oh, why are you writing that? That I exchanged the bottle of pills for this big old Bible in my hand. I would read, I've said this before, I would read it out loud to myself in the mirror back at myself until it sounded true, until I felt like I was what I was reading, that this was now my new identity right here. I was sitting, if you will, belly up at the table, feasting on the word of God in relationship with him, in him. You know, Dave said something weeks ago during his growth track series. He said it was just ad lib. He didn't even plan to say it, and I wrote it down and highlighted it. He said, God is the ultimate picker. You know that show where they go off and they go kind of treasure hunting, and they buy and bid on other people's worthless trash. They say things like, ooh, I'm willing to pay top dollar for that one. They say, I can use that one. Ooh, look at that. I can use that. Give me that. Uncover that. They say things like, oh, that's just what I've been looking for. Y'all, that's Jesus. That is Jesus. He always comes looking for his lost treasure because we're valuable to him. I imagine, imagine him like the picker taking home his treasures and placing them on display at his table where he can lavish on them. He's so excited. They're worth something to him. I started thinking about the disciples reclining at the table with Jesus. They were nothing special outside of what Jesus saw in them and pulled out of them. I liken it in all due respect to the Lord. Humor me here. I was thinking about a little girl having a tea party. <laughs> and she's got one-eyed Barbie and, <laughs> and floppy teddy bear who needs some stuffing with a, a brown stain that you're hoping is chocolate on him. And she's there. And they all are dressed up. And there's fine china. And maybe they have crowns on. And she is holding court. And you walk by her door and you're like, I wonder what she sees in them. I wonder what she sees in them. We say, I wish I could see what she sees. But to her, to her, her guests are hand-picked royalty. And to the picker, his wares are hand-picked treasures. Because Jesus has declared me worthy. No longer am I the sum of my flaws and failures. But my worth is greater than that. You, my friends, we, but let me tell you, you are more than the sum of your flaws and failures. We don't have to scramble and scratch for someone to define us. I am who he says I am. Back to Ephesians. In him, we are blessed, chosen, holy, blameless, adopted, worthy of sonship, redeemed, forgiven. Your identity is found in Christ alone. 
I feel like it makes more sense now. In him, what does that mean? In him, in his eyes, in his presence, sitting at the table in relationship with him, adopted into his family. When we say find your identity in Christ, that's what we're talking about. It says in Ephesians that we have redemption in the blood of Christ. He paid the ultimate price for me and for you with his blood, and my sins are forgotten. How about thinking of a picker? How about a swap meet, a big old swap meet where I say, I'll give you all of this, <laughs> and I'll take all of that. That's such an uneven bargain. But Jesus, in a, he says, deal, done. I'll take all of your everything, and I will give you all of my everything. It's a fabulous, miraculous transaction. And then he throws my sins, all the junk I gave him, the Bible says, into the sea of forgetfulness. What is that? That's, some, that's, some deep, that's a deep sea. The sea of forgetfulness. And he gives me all of this. The other phrase used to rid your sins is, it is separated, separated as far as the east is from the west. Like, let's just think about that. <laughs> like, the east? the west wait wait a minute <laughs> it's gone it is gone baby into the sea east to west your sins are forgotten our brokenness is made whole and now i'm an adopted daughter and an heir to a throne and i'm lavished on by a graceful and gracious god and then guess what the banner it comes down that banner comes right down. Because to him, I'm not a worthless, disposable piece of trash. To him, I am hand-picked royalty. To him, y'all are hand-picked royalty. Amen? Okay, I'm going to tell you a couple stories. Happier stories, perhaps. Uh, we're going to look in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 4 and then 2 Samuel chapter 9. And... Uh, I'm going to do the reading. It's not up here. You can jot it down and go there later and read the whole passage. It's very, very deep and interesting, and I'm just going to break it down for you. <laughs> yep, I'm going to tell you a story about a man named Mephibosheth. Pray for me as I say that 20 times in the next five minutes. <laughs> uh, all we really know about Mephibosheth at this point, is that he was crippled in his feet, that's the phrase the Bible uses, crippled in his feet from a fall when he was five years old. And his grandfather, ladies, we know this, his grandfather was King Saul, and his dad was Jonathan, and they have died. And the story, he's the last remaining heir. And the story goes that his nurse was running with him upon hearing that his relatives were dead, and she fell and it says the nurse dropped him, and he became crippled in his feet. And that is all we read. That's it. I'm like, oh, okay. Do you ever hear about something on the news, and you're like, oh, that's horrible. And then you just go about your day. Because it doesn't affect you, and you're like, oh, my gosh, what a tragedy. Anyway, where are we going for dinner? And that's kind of how I feel. That's how I feel this reads. Like, oh, no, poor guy. But let's stop here for a minute and think about this verse. Have you ever felt dropped? <laughs> Have you ever felt dropped accidentally or purposefully? Abandoned? Like you're cursed? Shameful? Slighted? Cut from a team? Fired? Rejected? Overlooked? I feel like overlooked is the worst emotion. And like you're stuck there. That's the end of your story. Like, here I sit, crippled for life. Because really, this seems like the end of Mephibosheth's story. He got one little verse, one little chance. 2 Samuel 4, verse 4. That's it, his whole life. And that kind of struck me. I'm like, huh, why would God include that? Except my big Bible, my big Bible, and all its little footnotes, in the tiny fine print, it says, for the rest of Mephibosheth's story, 
turn to chapter 9. And I'm there at my desk with my Kleenex like, what? What? I tell Chad, who Chad knows everything. I'm like, did you know his story continues? He's just walking by, yep. I'm like, oh. well, I didn't, and I'm going to turn there. Because you know what, y'all? Mephibosheth's story was not over, and neither is yours. You're not stuck there, crippled for life. So write down a note, turn to 2 Samuel 9. We're now going to see what happens. So now David is king, right, ladies? We've been studying the Old Testament, so just humor us. King Saul, King David, King Solomon. So King Saul. So now David's king because Saul and his son are dead. David's king over Israel at this point. And David had been best friends with Saul's son, Jonathan, and he promised him. Jonathan said, if I ever pass, will you please be kind to my descendants? And David said, yes, and he swore. So King Saul, they're gone. And King David's on the throne, and he's doing very well. This is early in his reign. And you know he's doing really well when he is sitting around thinking about who he could bless. <laughs> you know you're doing well if you're less up there one day like, hmm, who shall I bless today? And this is where King David was. He wants to know who is out there that I can bless, and he tells his servants this. Who's out there? Who? I remember I promised Jonathan something. Um, does he have any kin? Does he have any family? The servants say, yes, he does, but <laughs> just a little thing. He lives way on the outskirts of town. He's living in another man's house, which was a big deal. It would be like, the house of Dave, the house of Raymond, the house of Chad. And, like, you're so down and out, you're living in Chad's basement, you know, which, no shame if you have to do that. But back in the day, it was like, dun, 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 the household of so-and-so was a big deal. And so we see Mephibosheth hiding out in another man's house in another town, out, I imagine him in the basement, but maybe not, but in another man's house. And so they say he's over there, not doing well, and he's crippled. And David's like, go get him, bring him, bring him here. He didn't even bat an eye, like, wait a minute. No, go get him. So they bring him. Poor Mephibosheth bows down because it was custom to wipe out the whole entire family line of your predecessor. Like, do not leave one of Saul's descendants. But he had made a promise. Mephibosheth bows down, and that's where we find, that's where we find him. He thought he was getting his head chopped off. He bows down. David says this to him. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Here's what Mephibosheth says in response, probably still on his knees, probably still worried about his head. He said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Y'all, all these years of hiding from the king and living in fear and poverty made Mephibosheth think of himself as worthless. David's response to him He ordered all his servants to give him everything he deserved, restore his inheritance to him, farm the land for him, and care for him and help him. Anything he needs, you will do for him. Then the Bible says, So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Sitting at the table with someone implies you're in a close relationship with them. Sitting at the table implied a close relationship with the king. No longer on the outskirts of town, living in another man's house, under another man's name. Now he's at his rightful place at the king's table. And the Bible says it again. I found this very funny because I studied linguistics in college, and I took a class on syntax, and it was like living in another man's house living in another man's house, like a whole <laughs> class on that. But it changes the sentence how, what em, where you put the emphasis. And uh, so I feel like God includes this phrase over and over and over again so that we'll get it. Four times in seven verses, he says almost the same thing. The first time, Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. 
the next time. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He brought him from the outskirts of town. He brought him close. He brought him in. This is adopted sonship. Where his flaws, he always ate at the king's table. And then it says, and he was lame in both feet. Like, why do you need to keep saying that? We got it. Back in chapter 4. Where his flaws and failures, y'all, are covered. Sitting at the table with a tablecloth. You don't see my shortcomings, if you will. His past mistakes and misfortune are forgotten. His flaws and failures are covered. And he is seen, once again, as hand-picked royalty. You are hand-picked royalty. If no one's ever told you that, let me tell you that. You are hand-picked royalty. Because the Lord always remembers his promises to us, like King David. They're showing us. The Bible loves, God loves to show you things in his word. The king has come to redeem us. And when he does, we, our souls realize their worth, and you find your true identity in him, in here. It doesn't matter what had happened to Mephibosheth or what his life was like thus far. His shortcomings and what he thought about himself. What is your servant that you would notice a dead dog like me? Why are we so dramatic? Why are we a piece of trash? Why, why do we do that to ourselves? That's the enemy roaming around, trying to devour you. But not anymore. Now Mephibosheth sits and eats at the king's table like one of his sons. And that is how we are to see ourselves in Christ. One little small story for you. This one is found in the Song of Solomon, written by King Solomon. It's about a Shulamite maiden and the king who loves her. And uh, from, to me, it reads like poetry. And it all, like, kind of like a Shakespearean play. Uh, footnote. Reading Song of Solomon is quite spicy. So you could read it with your spouse, <laughs> like a Shakespearean play. Uh, but the Song of Solomon is, is, in all seriousness, is a love dialogue between this Jewish maiden and the king who loves her, and he's pursuing her. Uh, some say it's an allegory for God's love for his church, and some say it's a simple love story, and I would argue that it's both, that it's both, um, like the God loves to show us things to get us to go, oh, that's kind of how God loves us. And that's what I love about the Song of Solomon. Uh, we see this maiden, and she struggles with her self-worth, and she sees herself as a lowly peasant. And she sees the king there in all his splendor, and we know he loves her, and he is pursuing her. And she says things like this, like one part, I'm all sunburnt and dirty from working in the fields. Don't, like, don't come around. Don't come looking at me. She's like, look away. I'm hideous. This is what she's saying to the man who's pursuing her. And he's like, no, you're beautiful to me. I want to come see you. I don't care what you look like. Literally, this is what he's saying. She even agrees to see him one time, but only if he looks at her through a lattice, like a fence, like this. Like, okay, I will look at you, but like, like the way I watch scary movies, like, See me? Good. Okay, go away. This is how she's feeling about herself. Isn't that how we do? Isn't that how we do it? We keep God at arm's length. We put up, a, I'm fine. I'm fine. You can look at me, but only when I wear this mask and tell you I'm fine and keep you here. And they do this back and forth, back and forth thing for verses and verses and chapters and chapters. And I think, like watching a movie, I'm like, run to him, dummy. He loves you. He doesn't care. You know, you want to say that in the movie, like, run to him. He didn't mean it. You know, that's how I feel. <laughs> that's what I'm yelling at the Shulamite maiden. I want to say, if you could see yourself the way he sees you, that's what I want to say to her. That's what I want to say to y'all. God wants you to see yourself the way he sees you. You can read it yourself, again, in Song of Solomon. I encourage you to read both 2 Samuel and the Song of Solomon. One of my favorite parts of the Song of Solomon reads like this. It's in chapter 2. 
She says to him, the maiden says to the king, I am the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, which sounds lovely, except that those were super, super commonplace flowers at the time. Like she's saying, I'm average, I'm no big deal, I am literally a dime a dozen, please go away and do not pursue me anymore. And he says to her in response, like, au contraire, mon frere, <laughs> like a lily among thorns, so is my darling among the maidens. He's like, look, girl, you are one in a million. Stop all this nonsense. I thought about not saying this, but I'm going to say this. <laughs> I could be really, really hard on myself. And I'm like, meh, I'm all right. I've got good hair. I don't know, could work on some things. You know, you know how we all are. We are our own worst critic, constantly. When I'm really down, I go to my husband, who thinks I am the most beautiful woman who has ever walked the face of the Ooh. earth. <laughs> and so, y'all, the argument is over. So be it, right? Because, look, his opinion, in, in, in a very worldly sense, is, is all that matters. It doesn't matter what any, anyone else thinks. It only matters what he thinks, because I was created for him. That's all. So, boom, deal's done. What am I... What, you said it last week. What am I so upset about if the only one that matters thinks I'm perfect? God's opinion is all that matters. It's all right here. You want to know his opinion of you? It's right here. Read it out loud to yourself, into the mirror, back at yourself, until it becomes true. Until you're like, I don't care about your spare top sliders. God, God says right here that I am perfect and holy and blameless and chosen and adopted and redeemed and forgiven. It's right there. Spoiler alert, the maiden eventually realizes her worth and marries the king. And in verse 4, she makes this bold statement. She says, she, they, she decides to marry him, and she says, He brought me to his banqueting table, and his banner over me is love. Just like Mephibosheth, all that time of hiding from the king and living in fear and poverty made her think of herself as worthless. We've all been there. The sting, the dull ache. But now, she's sitting face to face, unveiled, no lattice, done keeping the king at arm's length at the table with the king, and she feels loved. You are God's prized possession. Not disposable or worthless, not a dead dog. You're a lily among thorns, and his banner over you is love. You've been bought at a very high price by the blood of Jesus. You've been adopted for a great purpose, and you're all destined for greatness. He bought you with his life because you're worthy. We read about it in Ephesians. That's why we're doing this study. Every word in here is true, and when you read it and you experience it and you live it out, it's a game changer. And that's what it means to find your identity in Christ. Amen. We're going to um, we're going to continue to worship, and as we do that, I just want you to uh, dwell on the message and dwell on the King's lavish love for you, and how your identity can be found in Christ. Amen. Go ahead and stand to our feet. You know, Tammy said some, some really powerful things. 